Good morning, everyone. All right. Well, we're glad that you're here this morning, and uh, boy, we just have so many things to do. But before we go any further, one of the things I'd like to do real quick, and I kind of skipped over this earlier, is if you're visiting with us this morning, you're, you're a treat, you're, our, you're a blessing to us, we're glad you're here, you are our guest, and we'd appreciate it so much if you would take one of the visitor cards in front of you there uh, in the card holder, if you'd pull one of those visitor cards out, uh, one of our guest cards, pull that out and fill that out and drop it uh, in the plate. We're, we're going to have a plate in the back of the auditorium uh, today, so somebody that's hearing my voice that's responsible uh, to seeing a plate is set up in the back. I'd appreciate that so much. And uh, we're going to have a plate in the back, so if you'd fill out one of those visitor cards, drop it in there, or you can hand it to me on the way out of the service uh, if I get to make it to the back door. Sometimes I don't always get to make it, so we want to be able to give you an opportunity to drop that off for us so we can know of your visit. We appreciate you being here at Mill Road Baptist Church. It's a great honor and a great blessing. Well, I trust that um, you just came expecting God to do something today. I have. I have been so excited about being here this morning to preach to you this morning. Uh, on Wednesday, I started going downhill health-wise. By Thursday, I was like, I, I had a bad sore throat and everything. I'm just praying, Lord Jesus, please just break, break it open so I can be here this morning to preach. I've just been burdened to share with you today what all God is doing and continues to do And the unfortunate thing is, is God's doing things and, and there may be some of you that are still asleep and, and you might be missing it. And so my prayer is that God will wake you up and open your eyes this morning and that, that the giant within uh, the Christian world will begin to awaken and be used in a mighty way. Because that's what God wants to do in this world. And he wants to raise that giant up in you. And that giant is Jesus Christ. It's not ourself, it's him. And what he wants to do in and through you. This week has been a very, 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 very interesting week in this regards. We've had, we've had five people put their faith and trust in Christ this week. Isn't that awesome? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to take that for granted. Now, for those of you who have been coming for several weeks, we have four last week, and a week before that, we had, we've had a total of 21, 22 that have come to know Christ since the beginning of this year. That's amazing. And you know what my prayer is as pastor? God, just don't let me get in the way. I don't want to get in the way of this. And that's not even to speak of those that have stood on Sunday night. And those of you that don't come on Sunday night, you're really missing it. I mean, you're missing the upper room experience. I'm just saying, but that's, that's your choice. But I'm just saying, on Sunday night, we have people who are standing up talking about how they are rededicating their life and committing themselves to that, to, or fresh and anew to what God has stirred in their heart before. And you know what that's called? Returning to our first love. And that's what God wants of us, to either come to that place to realize we need him as our Lord and Savior, or to come to that place where we say, you know what, I've allowed the, the fire that God put inside of me, that love that he, that he injected me with at the point of salvation, I've allowed that to kind of fall and dissipate in my life. And I've heard some use the terms that they put new fuel on the fire, they put new wood on the fire, but God has injected a new thrust of love in their life. And I want to challenge you this. I can't wait to see what God's going to do before this service is done. I'm just going to tell you right now. This week, I just got to tell you a little bit of the story. I went to see a person who has cancer. It's, a, it's one of the relatives of our members. And I went into the home to sit down with them and to to talk to them about their relationship with God and to see what that looked like. When I walked in the home, there was a 28-year-old young man and a 23-year-old young lady 
who was there, and they were kind of standing around in the living room, and, and, and I started talking to this lady. Now, I don't know about any of you, but when I share Christ with somebody, the one of the things I, I really feel uncomfortable about is when there's other people, like an audience, watching the person I'm talking to, because just think if you were the person being talked to, how much that would just kind of feel like you had pressure on you, right? Like, what are you gonna do with what he's saying, right? You just, you, that's what it feels like. And so I'm sharing Jesus with this lady and talking to her about her relationship with God and the importance of what that looks like and if she hasn't given her life to Jesus, that she has a need that only God can fill in her life and, that, and what that looks like is, is putting your faith and trust in Jesus and committing your life to him and giving all that you have to him as far as making him the most important thing in your life. And just as soon as I said that, the 28-year-old young man sitting there intently looked at me and he said, Preacher, can I do that? And the 23-year-old young lady looked and said, Yeah, me too. And I said, Sure. And so I had the opportunity to share with both these two young people how that Christ paid an awesome price for them and how that he wanted to come in their life and, and they prayed and received Jesus right then. And just as soon as I was done talking with them, I said, okay, Karen, back to you. <laughs> and she said, I'm with you. And I said, what do you mean you're with me? Did you just pray as well? And she said, yes, I did. And here in that home, we had triplets. Isn't that awesome? Let's give Jesus a hand, right? Now, you say, ah, you know, preacher, that's a preacher story. Mike, you're with me. Did it happen, brother? He was sitting right there with me, and he was a witness of what happened. And I, I, I mean, to the best of my ability to utter what happened, that's exactly the way things went down. God is doing some remarkable things. On Wednesday night, after youth group was done, there was a, there was a lady in our church and those of you here that come to church regular, you know who she is, Lisa Hildenbrand. She went home and God had been dealing with her spirit so hard and her husband led her to the Lord on Wednesday night. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Listen, you know, I'm just gonna say to you, one of the things that pastors over the many years that I, I've been preaching and the many years I've sat under my father's ministry, one of the things that we've often believed is that people in the church just need, a lot of people in church just need to get saved. I mean, there is no signs of the living God inside of them. They're all about themselves and what they can accomplish, what they can do, and all that. But I want to tell you something. When you encounter God, it does no longer center around you anymore. And when life centers around you, you better, you better hunt your heart. You better know what's going on. I'm just letting you know. It's important to understand that. Now, like with Lisa, she was six or seven years old when she said she remembers her grandfather talking to her and, and, and wanting her to come to know Christ. And she remembered somewhat about that time and how she prayed a prayer. But you know, and here's what's remarkable, and you have to understand, uh, it's just like Shane getting saved several weeks ago. Remember I told you a six and a half hour delivery? When we started our conversation, it was six and a half hours later. Let me just say, just like a delivery of a child physically, my son took 11 hours before he, before he entered into this world. But there was 11 hours of, of just intense labor. For some people, that labor started when they were young and God began that process on them. And God's bringing about that new birth. And he brings about that new birth later in life. There are others, God does that pretty quick. And then there's others, it may be months, sometimes a few years. I don't know what God's doing in your life and maybe there's been a time in your life that you've encountered Jesus and the love of God came to live inside of you and you know that's real. You know that Christ was on the throne of your life. There's nothing any more important than that in your life. 
And maybe you have fallen away from that first love and that can happen and you need to return. But I'm just saying this morning, if that's not true about you and you've never experienced the love of God in your life, you don't know what it is to love, can I just tell you this morning that God wants to save your sorry soul just like he saved my sorry soul. Okay, I'm just saying, if you think of yourself as somebody important, you need to see it from God's perspective. We are absolutely nothing apart from him, but he's everything. We're but as a songwriter wrote, um, uh, such a worm as I. Okay, there's some that have rewrote that, that hymn and they want to take that word worm out because it don't build us up enough. We don't need to be built up. If anything, the Bible says we ought to be careful how high we think of ourselves. God wants to do remarkable things in and through us. We need to think highly of him. Some people say, well, that's not good on your self-esteem. Well, you need, maybe the problem is we got to quit esteeming ourselves. Start esteeming Christ. Anything valuable in me is Christ and him alone. I don't have to feel good about myself. All I got to do is feel good about him. And when I feel good about him, that's going to charge me uh, to, to run into the face of hell with a water pistol when I feel good about him, right? Because I know I can't do it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went, went through a fiery furnace, not because they were anybody, but because God was somebody. That's all. So I want you to know this morning that God wants to do remarkable things. I haven't even started preaching yet, all right? Um, but before I do, I, I want to have somebody come up that's going to share something with you. And, uh, and this is just simply a story of God's grace. A story of God's grace. Not anything to do with us. Not anything to do with the person going to come share this. This has everything to do with God. I'm going to use the red mic, Dale. And come on if you would, Seth. You can have a seat there and just share with the people. Well, uh, for some of you that are visiting or may not know me, my name is uh, Seth Gosser, and uh, we've been here for about six months at Mill Road, but we're not strangers to Mill Road. We, uh, we attended here probably in 99, 2000, sometime back, and, uh, and Shannon was actually saved um, prior to coming here, but she was actually baptized by uh, Pastor Bill, and we had served here for some time, but... Uh, um, a lot of things have happened in my uh, journey, as Pastor uh, John likes to use the expression, and that's what it is, this life. It's a journey, and things that we do, and things that we go through, and, and, and all the experiences, you know, a lot of times we may have a lot of regrets of some of the things that we go through and some of the things that we do, but each thing, each trial, each conflict we go through is God's just using that and to bring about something beautiful in our lives. And, as, as you all know, that if you've been here any length of time, you know, in the last several weeks, Pastor has been teaching about loving God and loving others and about making a difference. And, uh, and, and it really, you know, really started to impact me on Sunday night on the, on the 11th. And as you say, I wrote some notes because I may get nervous and forget what I'm saying, but I just want to kind of stay on target here. But he, he was teaching uh, 1 Corinthians 13 about love and what love is and all the things about, about love. And, and I started really kind of listening to what he had to say. And, you know, and we kind of had this circle thing going on on uh, Sunday nights. You know, we were kind of looking at each other and, you know, and stuff. And I'm sitting kind of across from Shane. And every time Pastor's reading a, a verse, and Shane's like, well, what are you staring at me for? And, and really, it, it, you know, I really, it should have been a mirror there because I was really looking at myself. But he just happened to be sitting across from me. But, that, but that's okay. And, uh, but, you know, I just began to review my life and really look at a lot of the things and what, what was my motivation for doing what I did and, you know, and a lot of things and just listening to verse after verse. And, you know, I, honestly, I couldn't wait for that service to be over. It was really miserable for me, but I'm sure enjoyable for others. But, you know, uh, you know matter of fact, most of my life had been opposite of what that, you know, what that chapter really talks about. And, and uh, you know, again, because most of you don't know my background or anything, you know, I was introduced to a church through the bus ministry of Maranatha Baptist Church. I was about six, seven years old in that time. Um, you know, of course, like anything else, mom and dad would be glad to get, to get out of the house and sit him on a church bus while they stay home and do their thing. And, uh, you know, I got introduced to church and started attending church at a young age. And, uh, 
um, through that ministry. My dad was reached on door-to-door soul winning on a Thursday night, and um, dad enrolled me in their Christian school. I became in Christian school. Got kind of just had a background, a growth of being in church. Um, at a young age, you know, in junior church, I had a uh, made a profession of faith. And really, the motivation behind it was to get a piece of candy afterwards. And so I'd, I don't encourage we do that in our, in our youth department, but uh, it worked for me. You know, I made a profession, got a piece of candy. It was a good day. Um, uh, as I, again, growing up in church, you know, the type of church that I was a part of, I don't know if some of you may not be familiar, but it was, you know, basically in the same circles with, a, with Brother Jack Hiles, Dr. Lester Roloff, Oliver B. Green, um, uh, Dr. Lee Robertson, a lot of those circles, a lot of those, those big name preachers of that era and that time, that's the type of church I'd grown in, very, very conservative, very, some would say, you know, legalistic, but just a church that wanted to basically try to teach you how to be separate from what they for all appearances of things that would destroy your testimony or destroy the church testimony. So very much about outward things that you needed to do and things you needed to perform. So that's the environment I grew up in. The Christian school was the same way. It was, you know, you had to come to school with a smile on your face. The times that you didn't, you know, you got detention for not doing so, you know. If you didn't speak to somebody when you walked into the, to the school, you know, again, more detention. You know, it was all about your outward, what you're doing, what you're doing, trying to teach you again in a way. I mean, I'm not downing that, but just trying to teach you how to interact with people and, and how to, uh, you know, how to just do some things as a Christian should. Just, again, trying to mold somebody to do some things as they ought to do. But, but in all of that, I graduated Christian school, um, right after school, you know, I mean, as our, my, my uh, childhood pastor liked to joke, you know, uh, I wasn't going to let anybody tell me anything to do, so I went off and joined the Marine Corps. I mean, that's the most logical choice, and so I joined the Marine Corps right after high school, um, served in the military, and through that is how I met my wife, Shannon, and, uh, you know, and that's just another story that I'll leave for another time, but, you know, served in the Marine Corps, I, uh, you know, I also have served in the National Guard, done a lot of those things in, in service to my country. But, but military life was easy because of the type of background that I had, the type of church that I grew up in, the type of school that I grew up in. You know, it was very easy to just follow orders, do what you were told, kind of kind of comply with, with whatever it is. When someone tells you you need to do this or that, you just did it without thinking, without asking. Um, Bible memory was just key in our school. I mean to graduate to the next grade, you had to memorize complete books of the Bible. I mean, you had to do so many of these things. You know, it was just felt like it was just so regimented, so routine, so many things that you needed to do. But, uh, you know, so I went through this. Again, I'd heard a message on hell, scared, literally, scared the hell out of me, I guess you could say. I mean, I was about 12, 13 when I heard that sermon, when I heard that message. And it just really, it rattled me as a young boy. You start hearing these, this description of hell, and, uh, you know, it just played a, played a part of me. And, of course, at that time, you know, I didn't want to go there. And I think anybody, if you'd be honest with yourself, you don't want to go there. And, uh, you know, so, again, I prayed another prayer, you know. So now I'm up to prayer number two. Prayed another prayer. Didn't want to go there, so that's what I did. But, but all through the school, a lot of rebellion, totally. I mean, they would tell you, you talk to anybody, my teachers, they tell you I probably wrote majority of the rules for the school. It started off maybe as a two-page book, and it was in volumes when I graduated. I mean, it was come out with a forklift to bring out the school rule book. I mean, it was, it was intense. Uh, but, uh, you know, always against everything, always against the grain, you know, just, just, you know, there's just something there. You know, pray to prayer, supposedly a Christian, and, and some people chalk it up to just being a rebellious teenager, just being this or that, and, and so on and so forth. But just, there's always seemed to go against my youth pastor, just always seemed to be wanting to be opposite, you know, all through my teenage years, but, you know, getting in the military that don't help whenever you already have rebellion in your life, growing up in a Christian environment, um, as far as a church and school, um, got out there in the military, away from everybody, kind of lived my own life, did my own thing, fell into a lot of sin, things that I'm, you know, ashamed of now, but again, can't regret those things, because again, God's using all those things, even in my, uh, even in my background, but, um, Anyway, about 2001, I began realizing there's no chastisement in my life. None of these things was coming into my life. And, uh, you know, I talked to some pastors in the area. We was living in Florence, Kentucky at the time. I was working for KDL, which Pastor John and, and Pastor Bill was instrumental in getting me that, but that job. But I uh, uh, talked to some pastors in the area, and they all said it was just a backslidden life, just a backslidden condition. It was just, you know, you just need to get back to where you was at, ask God to forgive you and stuff. And it just... 
just wrestled with that and, uh, you know, just something just didn't feel right. Good job, good money, lived, lived a horrible life in the military and years thereafter. But, you know, uh, again, I prayed again and, uh, you know, again, thought I was saved. You know, I kept asking God, kept asking him for something, kept, kept going after something. Again, as pastors use the illustration a lot of times, going in the same direction or the same path that Jesus is going, you know, and, and so I knew there was something missing, you know, at least I thought there was, I mean, how do you do a lot of those things, how can a quote unquote Christian do those things, and God not punish him, or God not chastise him, so um, I prayed a prayer, and then after that, because I'd grown up in church, I had knew all the good things to do, I had known all the works that you should do, I began applying those things in my life, so over the next 11 years, you know, I've served as a, you know, a in the church bus ministry as a bus driver, a bus captain, Sunday school teacher. I've been assistant pastor on two different ministries. Um, I've been a youth pastor, an outreach director. I've done a lot of the works of the church, and I've, I've done them very well outwardly. Um, you know, I had a life full of good works, but, you know, at home it was a different story. You know, at home I wasn't what I was outside of the church. I lived a life at home the Shannon would tell you, I think they cringe when I get home from work some days because it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant for them because it wasn't pleasant for me because I didn't like my life, I didn't like my job. I, when you live a double life, when you live something that you're really ashamed of, that guilt plays into how you treat other people and, how, and your relationships with other people. I mean, you can be mean, you can be nasty, you can strike out, you can lash out at them because you feel bad, you want them to feel bad as well. So my home life was nothing really part of hell on earth for Shannon and Chloe and Matthew and and uh, you know with Matthew never really paid much attention to him always had my list of things that he had to do I get home from work had to make sure he'd done that list because again growing up in that Christian school growing up in that environment I was in it was all about what you did and I had to make sure when I got home he had had his chance he's trying to talk to me trying to share his day and I had to make sure he got those I didn't want to listen to that I wanted to make sure he did he do what I told him to do did he do the rules did he do what I expected of him. Was he living up to my expectations? And a lot of the things that I, I, I really got onto him about were things that I really wasn't doing in my life at home. Outwardly, I was doing a good thing. Outwardly, I was a good Christian. Outwardly, most people would be shocked to, to have me up here saying what I'm saying now because I did those things. I mean, I served, I worked, I taught. I just poured my heart and life into the church. But I was lacking at home. I was lacking a lot of things. And, and, uh, you know, and so, uh, you know, again, the book of James talks about showing our faith through our works. You know, it's not, again, salvation, not a work salvation, but an outward expression that we have something in our heart by the works that we do and, and, the, and the things that we do in service of Christ. But, uh, you know, and, and anyway, I met with Pastor, you know, John after that service. You know, kind of, you know, get me get back to where I, where I need to be. But met with Pastor John after that service, you know. Um, about a week later, it was on a Saturday evening, I wanted to talk to him. And that whole week been bothering me, you know, I mean, I just can't understand why I'm being rattled with this thing of salvation. Why is he coming by rattling my cage? I've, I've, I've heard this sermon on 1 Corinthians 13 probably thousands of times, probably literally in my life, from different preachers, different ministries, different churches. never bothered me before, but just the way the Holy Spirit was using it when Pastor John was presenting it to me, he began to really show me some things in my life. And, uh, I, you know, after talking with him and we started about 9 o'clock, I think we finished about 3 in the morning that Saturday night. And uh, I don't, this man's amazing. I don't think he ever sleeps. But uh, he stayed with me. He talked with me. He, he kept, he was very patient with me. He kept showing me things from Scripture. He, you know, he would just... You know, it's just very, very calm in his, his counseling with me, you know, because, uh, again, growing up in church, living a very religious life, having a lot of works, you know, I mean, that's, 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 that's almost uh, a danger than just being somebody that just lives a world of, of sin and never been in the church before, you know, because it just seals in your mind that you've got to be a Christian. I mean, you prayed a prayer, you've done these works, you've done all these things, you've got to be saved. But as I start, you know, coming to terms with what love was, and understanding what love was, you know, I just, I couldn't sleep that night. I just, it bothered me. I got emotional. I don't get emotional. Shannon, I'll tell you, probably three or four times in my life she's, since we've been married, she's ever seen me cry. But I was, I was a mess. You know, I'm crying. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm talking with her. And like any good wife, you know, she's like, well, you're not that bad. You know, it's not really been that bad in our marriage. And, and I, I know she's just telling a half truth, just trying to kind of get me through it. She just didn't know what to say. I mean, I'm, I'm an emotional wreck. But you know, I, 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 somewhere, wee hours in the morning, passed out. You know, I had to get ready to come to church, so they wake me up. I'm coming to church, and Sunday morning service, you know, pastor's preaching. And at the end of the service, see Mike Weber, 
you know, just come up out of his pew there and come down the altar and, and give his heart and life to Christ. And, you know, that really rattled me, but, you know, I wasn't going to leave that pew. I mean, I almost started crying, but I wasn't going to come up front. I wasn't going to do anything, you know. I just, you know, I got this thing settled. I'm a Christian. I've got to be a Christian, you know. But, but again, just looking back at 1 Corinthians 13, looking at how loving God and loving others and looking at that, and, man, just something just wasn't adding up. So Sunday night, pastor preaches, and then I, you know, he's going to have his leadership meeting, so I meet with him at his house, and we agree to do that. And, uh, and again, got there about 10 o'clock, and, I don't know, again, just going back, he's having me read passages of Scripture and read some things, you know, and just letting the Word speak through me and again, again chip away at some things in my life, chip away at that religiosity that I had, that, that works-based thing that I had sealed in my life. And, you know, and, and, and so as I begin to, to reflect and, and use all of that and, uh, you know, uh, you know, just finally just broke, you know. I mean, he, he, he felt led at one point. He says, you know, just, let's just stop. He said, I just feel led to do this. He put his hand on my knee and he just began to pray. You know, and in my mind, I was like, you know, I just, you know, after he gets done praying, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go home. I mean, why am I here? Why am I wrestling this? Why, why am I having this struggle in my life? But while he was praying and he kept praying, I thought, you know, I praise the Lord, he didn't quit praying because if he did, I probably would have left. But at some point while he's just praying steadily, just praying. And, and so when I just finally began, when I opened my mouth and began to pray, I just broke, you know, and, and. And I just began to confess all the things in my life from childhood. Everything just started coming out and tears and weeping and just a broken heart and just, 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 you know, really just a shame that I had lived such a double life. Just a shame that I had done all these things in the name of Christ, but really it was for myself. My motivation was just for acceptance. My motivation was for, you know, just for people to see who I was and answering questions in church was just so people could draw to my knowledge, you know, just putting myself, ascending myself on a throne in a position that I had no place to be. But, you know, I never had wrestled with that until I really come close. And they say when you really draw close to Christ, that light really shows who you really are. You begin to see, and a lot of people get scared of that, so you back away. And you don't draw an eye into him. You back away and you go the other direction. And so as I came really close, as the Holy Spirit used that, I began to see myself for who I was. But I broke. And I prayed. And I was, you know, I, I got saved. And, and it's been different ever since. I mean, it, it's only been a week. It was only, you know, last Sunday night, Monday morning, somewhere. I lost track of time. He could probably tell you my testimony better than I can. But, uh, you know, it just just amazing this past week, you know, I, I, he said, now that we've got my heart taken care of, you know, now that we have that done, now we can start working on some other things in my life, and I began to make some things right with my mom and dad, I had a, I had a rough childhood, and I'm not going to go into details there, but, I, but I've been bitter against my parents, I called up, you know, dad the next day, I called up mom, made those things right with them, and uh, made some things right with my wife and my, and my son, and you know, and, and, and even in my, in my job, you know, I'd gotten to the point to where I didn't care if I was really getting there close to being on time or not. But this whole week, been trying to be there on time, trying to put in a really a, a, a good work. Just a lot of these things have just left, you know. And when you really, truly get saved, when you truly meet the Lord Jesus Christ, see him for who he really is, there's going to be such a change that will come about in your life. You know, as Shane says, I feel it. I didn't know what he was talking about feeling. I didn't feel nothing, you know. I mean, it's just church. I've been in church my whole life. What's this feeling that he keeps talking about, you know? Or you listen to preachers talk about abundant life. Well, what is this abundant life they speak of, you know? I'm, I'm miserable on the inside. I mean, I'm, there's no joy in what I'm doing. But, but being told that you got to put that ministry smile on your face, you know, being told to fake it till you make it, being told a lot of these things growing up, and then living a life of applying that, you know, you just deceive yourself, and that's where I was. I was deceived. And so, uh, you know, it's just basically, you know, it's a, you know, in simplicity, I was really lost, but come to the realization that I needed to be saved. And uh, as, they, as they say, that's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, <laughs> so one of the things Seth said to me that, night that we were talking as he said preacher it doesn't make any sense for this reason he said you don't understand I've ran with some of the biggest people there are to run with some of the biggest named preachers I've been right there with them I've, I've ran with them I've been in, underneath their ministries this that and the other and taking all that was said into totality I said yeah well so did Judas <clears throat> Don't matter who you run with, 
Matter of fact, it could be Jesus himself and you could be going in the same direction as he was, just like Judas did. But he wasn't following Jesus. You know how we know that? Because rather than being sold out for Jesus, he sold Jesus out. It's difference. God wants us to be sold out to him. That's what it's about. Salvation is about everything that's important to you. You let go of it and you give it to God and you let him do what he wants to do with you and through you. That's what salvation is. So again, the disciples, before they were called to be his disciples, there were those that were there mending their nets and knowing that the things that they had in their hands was the very livelihood that defined who they were and who they were going to be in the future because this was their father's business. And it was just by their culture that every young man took their father's business and carried it on. And if you didn't do that, you were rejected by that, that society. It wasn't a choice. You just did that. And so in their very hands was that which was the most important element that defined who they were. And when Jesus said, come follow me, the Bible says they immediately dropped their security. They dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. That's salvation. Salvation is when we let go of our confidence in religion and all our good deeds, and all that we've done. And boy, I've got to be a Christian because look at how good I've done and all the things that I've done. And, and I've even gone to church all my life. And you hang on to that and it'll send you straight to hell. Because there's only one thing. It'll save your sorry soul. And that's Jesus Christ. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The great I am, the one that wants to impact your life and change you, who is love, and he that knows God knows love, for God is love. And he that knows not love knows not God, because God is love. If you know God, you're going to encounter love. And when you encounter love, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to permeate through your life. And that was one of the things that Seth shared with me that night as he said, Pastor, I've I can't honestly say that I've ever loved. I don't even know what love is. I don't even know how to love. I always thought love was obedience. Listen, a person can obey and never love. But a person can never love and not obey. You see how those two things can mirror each other? And somebody go, oh yeah, well they, they must love because they obey. That's not necessarily the case. I used the story, I think, on Wednesday morning in dad's, uh, um, in the service on Wednesday morning. One of the things that happened years ago when my brother's just a little, I wasn't born yet, but I was told the story. My brother, it was over in the chapel and the service was going on. And everybody was singing, and everybody was going on. And, and then when it's time for the preaching, everybody sat down and my brother Steve's on the front row, kept standing. And my dad got up to preach and he said, son, you can sit down now. And Steve said, I don't want to sit down. And he said, son, sit down. Dad's getting ready to preach. He said, I don't want to sit down. He said, son, sit down. And so my brother reluctantly sat down and he crossed his arms and he said, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. Somebody can obey, but not necessarily love. But love will always bring about obedience. Don't be confused between the two. Just because you've been doing the right things, going to the right places, because that's what you were told is supposed to happen, doesn't mean you're motivated by love. Michael tell you, he came Sunday morning and he poured it out to God because he said it wasn't that he was ever motivated by love. It wasn't a motivation of love that drove him. It was an act of obedience, a head knowledge. My friend, the encounter with God is different. It's life changing. And I want you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. And boy, I'm really going to have to go quick. Because um, I've been real anxious to share this with you, but I don't, I don't want to sell it short. Same time, I want you to just grasp hold of this. 1 John chapter 5. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 1 and following. The scripture says in chapter 5 and verse 1 Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone that loves him 
that begat loves him also that is begotten of him. Now, let me just stop there for a moment. I want you to understand. This scripture says, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. Now, you have to understand, that's more than just a head knowledge belief. It's not, you got to take the word of God in its fullness. And it's not just saying that you're to believe in. See, the Bible says that the devil believes in God and trembles. But we know what his end is, right? God's prepared a place for him and his angels. It's not a matter of what you believe in. It's a matter of what you believe on and who you believe on. And that's by faith. And when it says that whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Christ, Jesus the King, Jesus the Savior, the prophet, the priest, and the King, he that believes that Jesus is all, he's the one that's in charge, in control, the one who is the Savior of all men. He who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that means those who have put their personal faith and trust on him. The scripture says in verse number two, is born of God. And everyone that loves him, that begat, loves him also that is begotten of him. This word begat, begotten has to do with born. By the way, let me just say this morning, there are a lot of people that go to church every single Sunday, they're going to split hell wide open. I just want you to know that. It's going to happen. The thing that I desire more than anything is that every person in this church examines their heart and knows that, that's, that they're not going to be one of them. I can't bring that assurance in your heart and life, only Jesus Christ can. And I want you to understand, in our series that we've been talking on, Come Fellowship, this morning's message and is, is just simply that you, may know, that you may know, that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. God wants you to know. He doesn't want you to guess so. He wants you to know. I read a story uh, where uh, an illustration said if you were... 20,000 feet in the air in an airplane and the door was open. You're standing at the door and you're about ready to be pushed out the door. And somebody says, oh, by the way, you got your parachute on? Well, I hope so. You say, you what? You hope so? What do you mean you hope so? Because once you're out the door, ain't no hoping you did. It's done. Right? You're standing at the edge of life itself. You don't know what your day holds. The Bible says our life's but a vapor. It appears for a little time and it's gone. You're standing at the edge of eternity. And the question is, are you a Christian? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Well, I hope so. Seriously. There's no turning back. There's no turning the hands of time back. You better know so. And the scripture tells us here that this book of John is written in order that we may know. John, you can go to the next slide. That we may know. Here we go on and look at this passage. It says uh, at the very end that, and everyone that loves him that begat, that's talking about the Father, loves him also that has begotten of him or that has been born of him. In other words, what is, listen, I just want to remind you of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want you to know that we can say that we love the only begotten son of God and yet convince ourselves. How can we convince ourselves that we can refrain from loving those that are begotten of the Father. How can we say that we love the only begotten Son of God and every person who comes to know Jesus as their Savior is begotten of Him and you can say that you don't have to love them? Those that are made in His very own image. 
they're begotten of God. How can you say you love the begotten one and you hate the begotten one? How can you do that? Scripture says you can't. You're deceived if you believe you can. A Christian has the love of God in their life and the love of God will cause them to love those that are begotten of the Father. And it goes on to say, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So let me think for a minute. His commandments, the Bible says... Jesus, when he is approached, all right, 613 commands. Which one's the most important, Jesus? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second is just as important to love others as yourself. So listen to that verse again, keeping that in mind, because the, Jesus went on to say, all the law, the 613 laws, and all the prophets, everything any prophet ever said, and anything any prophet will ever say, is wrapped up in these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love others yourself. So it says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. It's kind of like a little vicious circle there. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. In other words, his burden is light. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know what he's saying? Listen, he was a rabbi, a teacher. And what he was saying is all the rabbis and teachers to this point in time has tried to lay a yoke of burden around your neck, has laid a yoke of teaching around your neck, saying you got to do this and you got to do that and this most important, that's most important. And it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And Seth understands what I'm talking about. He went through just trying to figure out what's most important. And man, everybody says this and then they say that. And, they say, and Jesus said, look, my yoke of teaching is easy and my yoke of teaching is light. Love God, love others. Boils down to that. Now that's why on Sunday night I've been teaching on what love is because how in the world can you love God and love others if you don't even know what love is? So you gotta know what the Bible says love is. So the application of love is applied to our life to see whether or not we love God and love others. But may we understand for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Now, I just want to remind you back a reflection of chapter 4 and verse 10. The scripture just simply says, herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is love, by the way. You want to know what love is? It is all that the Father God did on our behalf through Jesus Christ, who is a propitiation or a substitute for our sins. Greater love have we never experienced than that love. That is the greatest love mankind could ever experience. And that's what love is. But then, verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Love God, love others. In verse number 4 and verse number 5, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. By the way, that just simply, if you look that up in the Greek, that word overcometh means you have overcome. For whosoever is born of God has overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is he that over, has overcome the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The sinner is Christ. On your life's throne should set Jesus Christ himself. Nothing else should be important to you when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. Nothing should stand in the way. So the rich man came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, no problem. Go do this, go do that, and go do something else. And I remember talking to Seth about this. And, and I said, you know, and the man looked at him and said, I've been doing that since I was six or seven years old, Jesus. Been doing that since I was a youth. Jesus said, oh, one other thing. I want you to go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and then come follow me. And he said, Jesus, 
It's my security. What are you talking about? I, I'm a man of great wealth. I can't let go of that. That's been how I, I mean, that's the identity of who I am. Jesus said, then you're not worthy to follow me. So what is it that you got your grubby little fingers wrapped around and trusting, depending on? A prayer? A religion? Security of your job? The power in your life? The prestige? Man, I don't know what people think. If I gave my life to Jesus, people think I was a Jesus freak. Well, so what if they think you're a Jesus freak? If you don't care, then you're not worthy to follow Jesus. You got to let go of what you are holding on to. You got to be willing to let loose and let God take that and use it in remarkable ways. So that's the encounter with he who is love, Jesus himself. And so we go on to see in verse number nine, look with me if you would, it says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. The pats on the back, Seth, or for anybody else, the pats on the back is a witness of men. Hey, you're doing good. Keep it up. Keep it up. You're doing good. But the witness of God is greater. And if you don't have that, you're in trouble. Doesn't matter what anybody else around you says. What matters is what is God saying to you inside. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are. And the who you are would determine what you do. But there are some people who are so focused on the what they do that they overlook the most important part, and that's what's happened on the inside. Pharisees had the what to do down, didn't they? Jesus even said, you're like white and sepulchers. By the way, for those of you who don't know what that means, Jesus is saying you're like a well-bleached uh, burial tomb. You know, you've seen those... those Above ground tombs are what, you know, they, I forget what they call those, but mausoleums, but, but they have the individual ones where they'll put somebody in. You know, you've been to places where they'll have that and it's, and, and it's beautiful white, but the Bible said to the Pharisees, you're like a whitened sepulcher full of dead men's bones. You might look good on the outside and everybody might say, wow, how beautiful is that? But it's full of dead men's bones. God wants to raise those bones alive in you. God wants to give you new life. And, the, and you may receive the witness of men, but the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. Verse number 10, look at it with me if you would. He that believe, believes on the son of God has the witness in himself. He that believes not God has made him a liar because he believes not the record that God has given his son, given of his son. Now get this, don't miss this little word, it's really important. It's the fourth word in that verse. You look at it with me if you would. See it? What's that word? Somebody say it. On. He that believes on the son of God has the witness in himself. It's not a matter of just believing in, it's a matter of believing on. You can believe in an airplane all day long, but believing in the airplane will never get you from here to Cincinnati or anywhere else, Indianapolis or anywhere else. You've got to put your faith on that airplane before it'll ever get you there. And believing in Jesus will never get you to heaven. You've got to put your faith and trust on Jesus. It's having a total sellout, trusting him and him alone. And it goes on to say, he that believes not God has made him a liar. What does that mean, pastor? Well, I don't want you to leave here this morning confused by no means. Because some of you maybe have said a prayer years ago. And maybe that's all you did was said a prayer. You tuck that in your back pocket and you feel pretty good that you said a prayer. That prayer ain't going to get you to heaven, my friend. It's not about a prayer. It's about an encounter with Jesus. If you've had an encounter with Jesus, then that's, that's a different story. If you came to a place where you committed your life to Christ, you said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you with my life. And that'd be true. 
then he that is love has come and he's dwelt within you. And the scripture says that when you receive Jesus, you receive eternal life. Because embodied in Jesus is eternal life. There are those who receive Jesus in their life and they've committed their life to Christ and then they've lost sight of their first love and they find themselves drifting in a place in their life that God says, I want you to return to your first love. And there may be those here that are in that place today. You may say, Pastor, I, yeah, I, I really truly committed my life to Christ and I'm following him and in my life when I received him and man, I was sold out and I had a desire to know God's word and to study God's word and to be around God's people. It was there, love was there and I know it. But yeah, I fell away from that. And my friend, may I help you understand, the Bible says, and it's written to those who do just that, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In this very same book, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. You say, but pastor, I've done that. And, and man, it seems like I get it back on track with the Lord. And then all of a sudden I fall away again. The Bible doesn't say just do it once. That's written for every day, every moment, every second of every day. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us. And it cleanses from all unrighteousness. And you say, well, I do that. But still there's something that is just in my heart. I Listen. Your heart is wicked and deceitful above all else and no man can know it. And all I can tell you is this, your heart will lead you astray. And people say, follow your heart. God says, follow me. Amen. We shouldn't follow our heart. Our heart will deceive us. All I can tell you is this, if God's salvation has penetrated your life and you've encountered the love of God in your life and you know the sweetness of that relationship. At one point in time in your life, you had that and you loved God, you loved others and you just had a desire after him and you've fallen away. You just need to return to your first love. You maybe felt that at one time and it was real. My friend, all I can say is you need to return to your first love. But if you're like Seth today and you say, you know what? Feel what? I don't understand what they're talking about. I don't know what that's about. My friend, I want to tell you something. When you encounter the love of God, I used this illustration one day, and I'll use it again here near the close of my message. If you're driving down the road, and all of a sudden you have flat tire, boom, blah, 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 and you pull over the side of the road, you get out of the car, and it's a busy highway, and you get out, and you pull the spare tire out, and you jack the car up, and you take the lug nuts off, Actually, you break them loose first, right? And then you jack it up and you pull the lug nuts off. You set the tire off side, put it on, and put the lug nuts back on. And you set that car back down. And you grab your stuff and you step back and you look at that car. And it's like, oh, yeah, got it fixed. A semi-tractor trailer truck coming down the road. You and Sim come and takes you out. And you have an encounter with a semi-tractor trailer truck. I promise you this, your life will never be the same again. And when you have an encounter with Jesus, your life will never be the same again. It's not a little breeze of a little wind and you feel good. It changes your life. You look at Seth, who was, a, I mean Shane, who was a man that could care less about being in church and around God's people. He's a different man today. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That doesn't mean that Shane doesn't still have internal struggles. We've talked about that too. All of us have that. And you will as long as you live. That's what Roman talks about. The flesh and the spirit, they war against each other. But who are you committed to? Who's on the throne in your life? For Seth, he said who was on the throne in his life was himself. Everything he did was about himself. My friend, it can't be about ourself. Our motive has to be Christ and him alone. Verse 13, look at it with me. And it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know, and here it is, that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. All these things have been written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. So you got it? Don't say, I hope so. You're on the edge of eternity. Don't be saying, I hope so. 
If the Spirit of God has dealt with your heart today and you understand how close you are to the very edge of hell, my friend, if you don't know Jesus, you need to fall on your face before him and cry out to him and repent of your sin and call on him to be your Lord and Savior and he'll receive you unto himself. Commit your all to him, seeing that you are nothing and he's everything and that you, that you get your focus on him and his love and allow him to live through you. And if you haven't done that, I want you to know God wants you to do that today. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning.